Welcome to Influential Visions Podcast. Here, we interview futuristic leaders who share their deep industry knowledge and business experience with you, ensuring you have your finger on the pulse and your eyes wide open. Hi, I'm Kim Adele, and I'm joined by Nat Schooler, who's my co-host on the exciting new podcast series, Mastering Imposter Syndrome. Hi, Nat. Hey, Kim. It's, uh, it's absolutely such a pleasure to, uh, to work with you on this. And uh, imposter syndrome, I had no idea it was such a big thing. It's, it's absolutely huge. And, um, you know, senior leaders in technology uh, really do struggle with this, the same as everybody else. And I'm, I'm absolutely amazed. Uh, you know, we've done quite a few of these interviews already. And it's, very, very interesting to kind of hear how these people really deal with this on a day-to-day basis. Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, imposter syndrome, they say, will impact up to 70% of us at some point in our lives. And often when we're the one feeling that imposter, we think we're on our own. We think we're the only person that has that funny little voice telling us that we're not enough or that we can't do something. And yet, as this series will show, even some of the most influential leaders around the world and, and within technology we all face that fear at some point. We all face that little voice that's telling us that we can't do that, whether it's in um, in meetings, whether it's finding our voice, whether it's putting ourselves forward to do something that we really want to do, but we're just not sure we're ready. And the series has already been so insightful in people sharing how, one, they felt that, and two, how they've overcome it. So I'm excited to see how this series is going to help other people when they're facing their imposter to actually master it and go and live the life they want to. Yeah, very much so. And I mean, I think, you know, from, from, I mean, I I knew nothing about this, but I've kind of been studying self-development for sort of about 10 years, maybe 12 years on a, on a kind of, you know, more intimate level. Right. Um, And it's, it's actually quite amazing. Like when you, when you speak to different people and how they actually deal with this is, is different for each individual, right? Like, I mean, I know, I know some people like they, they have their morning routine and they get up and they have a cold shower or they, they, they drink their coffee and have an orange juice. Then they have a cold shower and they exercise. And, uh, but like dealing with imposter syndrome is very much like that. Like everyone has a different kind of angle to it. And I've just found it very interesting, you know, especially, especially like talking, talking with, uh, talking with Jane Archbold, uh, CEO, uh, that's been very interesting and how she sort of, you know, really dislikes kind of face-to-face networking events and, and how she feels vulnerable there. And, you know, and I just found that interview quite interesting. I mean, they've all been very interesting and, you know, in particular, I like the way that, the leaders that we've spoken to are just like, well, look, it's, you just got to get on with it. You, you can't just wallow in, in, in this kind of um, space of like, it's almost like you feel sorry for yourself. Like you, you can't wallow in it. Right. Because the more you wallow in that, Oh, look at me, you know, and, and complain almost to yourself. um, The more you kind of think about it. And then the more momentum that, that those thoughts kind of build. So you've almost got to just, not switch off that inner imposter because you're not, you, you're probably never going to switch it off because there are always these thoughts that come up that you need to kind of deal with. But going through the process that you taught me has been so helpful for, for like, you know, waking up in the morning, maybe, you know, while I'm doing my exercise, I might, I might have this thought of, you know, something bad from when I was a child and actually following the process, the seven step process that you, that you outlined in our workshop that we did, it's been so interesting, really, really useful. Yeah, no, and you're right. I think, you know, it is different for everybody. Um, You know, the the questions that we ask and how we're going to, to overcome it is very different, but the steps can be the same. So how you'll apply the steps are very different. And I think that comes out, it rings out in, all of the interviews that we've done, which is that how they've almost been able to um, force themselves to do it anyway, to, to say, I'm not going to listen to that voice, I'm, I'm going to do it. And, and actually what we find often is 
you will have lots of people who outwardly look extremely successful and you assume, well, it's all right for them. They never feel like this. They never doubt themselves. They never have any challenges. And the reality is that's not true. We all do have those. We, I believe, you know, everybody has something that they're vulnerable about, something that they hope nobody finds out. And, and our little inner imposter yells that at you all the time. I, I know myself having done this, but I, that's why I think this series is, is so great to be part of because we're learning that actually one, we're not in it on our own. We're not the only person that has that, has that little voice. Um, and that actually there's so many ways and examples that you can quieten that little voice and go on to be really successful. And I think that's, for me, the key part of this. It's why we're both doing it, isn't it? To help people and to free them to go and enjoy their life rather than deal with living under that constant beration of yourself for not being enough. And I think that probably is a great way to... Um, end and segue into our first episode which is with as you've already mentioned one of one of um, your favorites the fabulous Jane Archbold so shall we go to her interview we are we are privileged uh, to be joined by Jane Archbold hopefully I've pronounced Archbold right yep <laughs> and you are a seasoned executive with a, a record of driving product innovation, operational transformation, integration of acquisitions and delivering business growth. Currently, you're the CEO and managing partner of IPTOR, a global ERP provider with an HQ in Sweden. So, uh, yeah, and you were formerly uh, at, at Sage for 18 years, latest position CEO Europe mid-market. And uh, you're also a non-executive director and investor in Notify Technologies and Sabre, which are two UK startups. And you are passionate about people and making a difference, which is, which is great. So <laughs> thank you, Jane, for, uh, for joining us. I'm quite excited about this whole series, actually. And yeah, it's, uh, we learn so much from talking about this important topic. Okay, fabulous, Nathaniel. Thanks. So that's the, the sort of glossy part of Jane. Um, what I would also add to that is I am from Newcastle upon Tyne, uh, in, which I'm very proud of, proud to be a Geordie, but actually living now here in the Cotswolds and on lockdown, so quite quite a challenging um, time for me as it is for many people because I'm usually traveling around with a global business. Um, I'm also um, mother to four, well, stepmother to four grown-up sons, recently um, had a, a new grandson, and, and two dogs. So that's a little bit more about the, the, the real Jane, as I would say as well. Oh, I love it. And, and Jane, I mean, we've known each other. Oh, we, we were just chatting. It's been eight years since we last saw each yeah. other. I would absolutely uh, say, you know, your, your people skills and your leadership, you're renowned for. Um, and you demonstrate that daily, why, how you show up and, and coming on here and sharing with us your journey is a real example of that. So I really appreciate it. But could you give us a little bit about your journey and kind of any challenges that you've had to overcome? Yeah, and I'll, I'll take us back. Um, so back when I was in a sort of probably my late twenties, uh, I joined Sage and I was sort of headhunted at the time. I was working in a, a different sector. Uh, Sage were going through a huge amount of growth um, and I had this exciting opportunity to join. And I was pretty apprehensive. Uh, you know, it was local, so I you know, drive to work, uh, knew quite a few people there. But my boss at the time actually was quite intimidating. And um, this is probably where it starts uh, in terms of that, that sort of inner voice. And uh, the lady was you know, fantastic at what she did. But I kind of felt pretty intimidated that she wanted to be me to be a certain way. And I actually went on for probably two years trying to be this person that someone else wanted me to be. And I'm sure that people can, can resonate with that. And um, it was actually a, a self-reflection time. I was kind of really reflecting, you know, business is going well. I was, I was doing well, you know, managing teams of people. Business was going through growth, but I just wasn't really happy. And I didn't feel that for me. I was making a, a bigger difference and I wasn't really realizing my potential as much. And when I thought about that, and I, I, I thought, I'm just not happy. And why wasn't I happy? And it was because I wasn't being myself. And I call this the sort of Jane Epiphany moment. I remember lying in the dark, listening to some music on the floor in my lounge, 
just reflecting on all of this and I thought you just need to be yourself and actually if being me isn't good enough then that's actually okay and, and for me that was quite a brave thing to do sort of I was probably 28 29 at that point and and actually from that moment on I would say that's probably been the turning point in my life both professionally and and at home as well so the the authenticity and actually it's okay to be you probably as as was my starting point oh, I love that and, that, and that's that so resonates I, I remember also spending many years trying to be the version that people wanted you to be and looking around at all these amazing corporate people and going oh my god I don't fit in <laughs> yeah <laughs> so fit and, and then you and then you start to try and be something you're not don't you yeah and, and linked to that, you know, I then was sort of working in this environment and thought, OK, I'm, I'm now OK. It's all right to be just Jane. And then having to go to networking events. And this even today is I get that feeling in my stomach where I think, oh, my God, I hate this. So walking into a room, usually in an evening, um, mostly men who I've never, ever met before and having to walk in and be expected to network. <laughs> One of my just I hate it uh, even now I absolutely hate it but back then I used to get myself into such a state and this usually would be involved in London so I'd be on the train going from Newcastle to London getting myself in such a frenzy about it uh, and I did that for years and my coping mechanism at the time was to think okay let me just think of three interesting things to talk about and I'll go in and I'll be okay and then as soon as I walked in the door and saw this sea of men and thought, oh, my God, I don't want to be here. And what time is it so I can get out? Um, so my key thing there is, I, I, you know, that, that's never gone away. It's still here now. And, you know, I've been around the block a few times, you know, at my age now and running different businesses. It gets it back to being myself and just thinking, you know, this is OK. But then thinking, what am I going to instead of what am I going to get out of this networking session? What can I give to the session? Um, and thinking about that in a very different way. Um, and also just having a few little, if, you, if it goes silent, what are the topical things that I'm going to talk about? So I always have a few links, news things that I might be interested in in my back pocket. But even back to that point, my first networking, I used to be terrified. Um, and actually, I got coached around this because I had this hang up about being from the Northeast and people are not going to, you know, think that I'm intelligent enough or I'm sort of from some sort of... Um, you know, backwater, you know, God only knows where the hell she from. And I really had that, that was my internal hang up. But until I chose to let go of that, which I did get through coaching. Um, and actually, I will remember the coach at the time saying, look, there's nothing wrong with Newcastle. You've got Anton Deck, you've got Alan Shearer and all these great things. And now you've got Jane Archibald. And I thought, actually, do you know what? Yeah, that's true. So yeah, that's a, another side to it. Very interesting. Very interesting. So when, when do you feel most vulnerable, Jane? I feel most vulnerable when I'm walking into a meeting where, and it's my perception that I'm with highly intelligent people, usually on more of a sort of mathematical or scientific side, which in the technology sector, there's a lot of those people. Um, so my background is not product. So I am a commercial business person deliver through other people. I do not code. I don't know the latest things around technology. I know enough to run a business. But my sort of fear is if I walk into a room and it's highly intellectual tech type conversation, that kind of makes me very vulnerable and very nervous. Me too. Um, <laughs> I, can't, I can't actually bear that sort of conversation. And ERP as well. Like, yeah. It's it, it's uh, it's very tough, right? Like I, I've I've sort of written a few blogs for Oracle around ERP, and okay. you know, to start with, I was like, well, what you know, what do I write about? It's it, and 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 it's and it took a lot of work and a lot of investigation to actually learn how to communicate around it. I mean, but these acronyms, they're the biggest mistake, yeah. the biggest problem, and it's like they just want to blow smoke up their asses. These people, I'm sorry to say, <laughs> like, I, I can say that it's my show. <laughs> absolutely Nathaniel I, I, I love it and you know welcome to my world so that, that's what I'm surrounded with so for me it's about knowing enough but I'm, I'm not never pretending that I'm the expert and not being frightened to ask the questions so the coming out with this bloody jargon and I have no clue what it is actually saying look can you just explain this to me in layman's terms uh the worst that I could do years ago I used to just sit there with a little smile on my face and pretend I knew what they were talking about and I had no bloody clue so I think that's really important um 
you know, that I, I'm aware of this, so I don't know all the details. Label that that I'm not a tech person. Uh, I'll give what my contribution is and then ask questions if I'm not sure. But yeah, it's not the most exciting. If I was you, I'd rather be writing about, you know, the planet or even shoes and handbags or holidays or something wishful rather than ERP. But hey, it no, but adds I, benefit to people's businesses. But I, I wrote about the Medici uh, family. Yeah. And, and, and how they sort of interact and brought that into accountancy, you see the first formalized ledger system and stuff. So it was quite, yeah, one of them yeah. was quite good. I enjoyed it, you know. Good, good. Well, I like to think with ERP, we make a difference. I don't just think about this as pure tech. So I was explaining um, to someone the other day, you know, what are you, Jane, what do you really do? And it was actually, it was one of uh, my friend's children. So I tried to explain, I mean, how do you explain to a seven year old child that you run a business that's ERP? So what I what I did was explaining that actually what my business does is is actually help people. And how do we help people? So our ERP is actually really there around businesses who are heavily distribution centric. So and we're focusing on the pharma space right now. So to be able to get a drug, so somebody you know calls a hospital, they need a drug and it's not available. They need it to get from one state in the US to the other our software enables that to happen and be there within you know seven hours and it can be tracked and traced all the way through that's what i like to think that i do in simple terms that's nice. how i explain it to a child there you go that must have been quite exciting for that oh. child. i would be <laughs> excited the concept of that is is exciting yeah. right so when it comes to like your imposter syndrome yeah how do you how do you manage it like when you when you go through these voices in your, not voices, but the inner voice, right, in your head that's saying, oh, I shouldn't be here, like I'm not amazing enough and like that kind of thing. Like, what, what do you do to manage that? Okay. The first thing is, I, is, is being mindful of when that situation is going to happen. So usually you're aware that you're going to go into a meeting or for me, it's one of those networking sessions and it's about preparation. So I know I don't like it. I'm never, well, it may be limiting belief, but I know I'm not going to like it. So I have to then firstly prepare. So it's about understanding, you know, what's the worst that could happen and let me prepare for the best outcome and the best outcome for me. So I'm looking at going to a networking event. I'm thinking I've got to spend an hour of my life under you know, talking to some people. How can I get, give the most and get the best out of it. So that preparation and just acknowledging that it might not be your forte um, and that it's okay not to be perfect. For me, it's pretty basic and it's as simple as that. And it comes back to just being myself. I love that. And that's such great advice because I think it's a, it is that whole part that says, actually, if you can shift your framing of it, like, you know, you're turning it into a, how do I add some value and gain some value because I'm trading an hour. Um, of, of my life and um, puts you in a different place doesn't it because yep. it's like, well, actually, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna add and I, I loved also the bit you said earlier about just ask the questions um, because actually you won't be the only person in the room that doesn't know what they're talking you know that doesn't yep. know what the other person is talking about so actually and it's often in those questions isn't it that you find yep. the nugget that's gonna yep. help move it I, forward. I, I, absolutely um, so I mean I focus a bit around that networking there are other examples that I've got um, where you know it's different to that. We, yeah. you know, earlier this year, uh, Christopher Caderfeld, who works with me at Ipto, we decided to do a management buyout backed by a German investment firm. Before getting into that, you know, we met a series of investors. And um, you're putting yourself on this beauty parade. And again, to get through that, it was all about okay, let's be authentic, let's be very open, honest, transparent about what, you know, what we're, we're looking to achieve here. That then puts me in a, a, a comfort zone. Of course, within that, you get what I call the hairdryer effect of just questioning on every damn thing. <laughs> and some of that, you know, I don't know about, but rather than get myself into this, oh, this is going to be awful, just expect that you can't control what you don't know and you don't know all the questions are going to get asked in that situation. So it's taking the ones that you can and then being totally honest about if you don't know the answer, actually just say the worst and this is a tip for people out there listening to this, the worst that you can do is try and bullshit your way out of it. So had I done that, and this has happened before, where people are trying to sell a business or get investment, you bullshit, you will get found out. Um, and, and that's true in any situation in life. So my, my advice to myself is just be very open, be, be very honest, give as much as you can to the best of your ability. And you know what, don't worry about the rest of it. 
that is such amazing advice i think i think often we we panic don't we that if we don't have the answer that people are going to think that we're not very clever whereas sometimes saying you know it's a great question i don't know the answer but i'll find out and i'll come back to you demonstrates that you can take control of a situation and you've got a level of confidence even if you're not feeling confident in that yeah, moment exactly yeah they could literally chat to you all day but i'm really conscious that you've got to go um, to another meeting and you've so kindly found this time for us um, so thank you so very much just before we end is there one tip that you could share uh, with the people listening that says you know if if you knew this years ago you'd have you'd have um, got where you were much faster being authentic as simple as that for me Be, being you being true to your core values and and, and that's it Fantastic. Thank you so very much. It's been an absolute pleasure and we'll speak soon. Thank All right. You. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks so much for supporting our show. Please do share this episode with your friends and business associates and click the link below to subscribe to the podcast. Until next time, take care.